Okay, I think it's nine o'clock. Let's uh, la, la, let's start on time, and uh, if, if some people join us in a few minutes, that also will be just fine. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I'm at the moment the director of of NITEP, that whose logo you see be behind me. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> this morning, I'm really happy that. Um, to start the, the, the more theoretical part of the of the school, um, and uh, you know you have to know that the, the, the NITEP has a summer school tradition that goes back almost 40 years. So every year uh, since the 80s, uh, we, we we or people that were <laughs> responsible for NITEP long before my time organized this, uh, this summer school that is named after Chris Engelbrecht, who was one of the founders of the idea of, of, of the summer school. Yeah? And uh, around three years ago, uh, we started uh, uh, what will hopefully be a, a new tradition yeah? and uh, joined forces with the CHPC. And, uh, <clears throat> And, and, and we rename this specific summer school uh, foundations of theoretical and, and, and computational science. So the basic idea is to, uh, to look at, uh, from a little bit more theoretical point, to at uh, issues and topics that are, that, that are relevant uh, at the moment. And, and, and link it to the, to the arts that you've learned in the first two weeks, which is uh, uh, scientific programming in, uh, in Python. Yeah? <clears throat> so, and, uh, and today, um, uh, it's it, it just a, a lucky coincidence. It's also the birthday of Galileo Galilei, who was born on the 15th of February in 1642. Yeah, so it's a good day to start a, a th theoretical discussions. Yeah, although we will have a little bit more quantum stuff, uh, but we also have uh, some uh, very interesting classical stuff that uh, Galileo Galilei will be very proud of us <clears throat> today. And 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 the first lecture this this morning is uh, by Professor uh, Morten Hjort Jensen, and at the moment he's uh, sitting in uh, in Norway. Uh, at minus 10, <laughs> so, so let's hope that he's nice and, and warm <laughs> in, his, uh, in his office there. <clears throat> and, and he will give us uh, a very nice introduction on, uh, uh, on Monte Carlo methods uh, uh, for, <clears throat> uh, for computational, for computational field, uh, on machine learning and methods for computational physics. Yeah? So uh, Morten, we are, we are really very happy uh, for you to be with us uh, this morning and uh, and all our participants and in the meantime they've grown up to 50 and I'm sure we'll get a few more uh, during the next uh, few minutes are, are very eager to to listen to to your lectures yeah probably uh, on average the character of the lectures these next two weeks will be a little bit different from from uh, from the previous one because the the, the, the interaction live with the lecturer will be crucial in uh, in the sharing of of information so i would encourage you all uh, to always attend all uh, all the lectures so that you also have the, the, the chance and opportunity to ask questions and uh, uh, and interact with the with the respective uh, lecturer. <clears throat> of course, we will record all all the lectures so that we will be able to to, to watch them later uh, as well. And the various materials will be made uh, available on on Moodle uh, as soon as possible if they have not already been put there. Yeah. Okay. So you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to to Morten. So Morten, please. Um, you, the, the show is uh, is all yours, and um, we are all very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Francesco. Uh, and it's a true pleasure to meet you all, guys. Even if we only meet in this kind of virtual way, uh, it would have been fantastic if we could have met in person. I mean, that's the. Uh, uh, that's really the way of doing things, but hopefully the, this kind of format uh, can uh, help us in, uh, how to say, softening the uh, lack of the in-person uh, contacts and discussions, all the kind of random walks we can make when we normally teach. And uh, uh, feel free to use the chat function, ask questions in the chat, and I will try to answer them on the way. Uh, I wanted to uh, direct you to uh, where I have all the material, so that you can actually download the material for this course. Uh, 
and uh, and use that one as you want so i'm just going to share the screen with you guys and you should now be able to see my screen here and the um, the i'm going to put into the chat here so somebody has already put into the chat here the uh, uh, link to the GitHub address. Uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with Git. Git is a, is a version control software. And uh, GitHub is just a provider where you can place your files. So this is just a uh, online provider. So GitHub was actually bought up by Microsoft two or three years ago. And uh, you will then find, if you look into the chat here, somebody has already kindly, thanks Omit, put in the uh, link to the, uh, to the lecture material. And what you will also find when you uh, look at this uh, standard, a little bit boring website, uh, there is also a link on the uh, right corner here, because GitHub has a deficiency. It doesn't display well HTML files, so they have provided something which is called GitHub Pages. And if you click on that link, uh, that's where you will find uh, the different uh, formats for the lectures. So you will find, if you like a PDF, you can use that. Uh, I normally like this uh, specific format reveal in in, uh, in HTML, but then you will also find the Jupyter Notebook. So we are going to run uh, a mix of uh, Jupyter Notebooks and uh, the slides, but I will also use my whiteboard in case we need to break down a little bit and uh, slow down the pace and look at some mathematical derivations. So hopefully the material which you will find here is... Uh, uh, well linked with what you've seen in the two previous weeks. Uh, the uh, links here, uh, you can download everything and, and probably if you're familiar with, uh, with GitHub, uh, what you can do then, if you click on this uh, Git and GitHub, you can click on this link code here and then you can actually clone, if you have Git installed on your laptops, you can then clone all the material and just use it as you want. Feel free to use this material in uh, whichever way. Uh, you will find if you want to, if you have a slow internet connection, but you're able to download the material, if you go into this doc folder, uh, in that folder, you will then find uh, in this pub folder, you will find the same material which is so displayed. So these are just the basic files you will find, like if you look in day one, you will then find the uh, uh, PDF files, the Jupyter notebooks, or the HTML file, if you prefer that, and you can start them with your browser. Anyway, feel free to uh, interject if you want to, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question or just use the chat, if something is unclear. And by obvious reasons, since I'm not uh, uh, a native English speaker, uh, I do have an accent, which also means that if something is unclear, please do let me know. Uh, if we now go into this website here, you will find the uh, daily plans uh, and the content of the course. I'm not going to go through everything, but you will typically find the topics which I plan to cover. So I would like to look at today at the, a basic introduction to machine learning and linear regression. And then uh, on Wednesday, we are going to look at linear regression again and something which is called the bias variance trade-off. So machine learning is a lovely field because it's a mix of uh, many of the things you've seen before. You need programming, you need uh, uh, a good knowledge of linear algebra, you need a knowledge of statistics, and many, many other things which you have seen throughout your studies. The, uh, we are going to end with uh, neural networks and uh, also methods like decision trees, random forests, and boosting. And we're going to see how we can apply these methods to uh, different systems or different data sets. So the idea now is more to take into account different data sets and see how we can uh, analyze these data sets, make fits, make predictions, and so on. So this, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the GitHub address here, I mean, the main page contains also uh, some information about uh, recommended uh, uh, packages, which we would like you to have on. So we normally, you probably already installed Anaconda or you installed many of these packages uh, yourself. Uh, there is Google's Colab, which I also recommend highly when you want to run machine learning applications. 
these are the Python libraries which you probably have met already. Uh, I'm going to quickly remind you today of some of it so that you can get started and look at some of the problems. By the way, uh, today what I thought of doing is more to run uh, these one and a half an hour. I'm going to split it in two. So there will be uh, basically two more uh, lecture-like uh, uh, types of presentations. And then we are going to look at more exercises on Wednesday and the days which come. But today I wanted to cover some material. And the kind of exercises which I want to give you guys is actually to have some of these packages installed and see that they function. And I guess that the last weeks you actually did this and you did practice with many of these. Uh, we are going to need some libraries to do machine learning. So one of these is scikit-learn uh, and the other one is TensorFlow, which was released by Google. And uh, if you want to use PyTorch, you are free to do that. That was actually released by Facebook. So these are the two big competitors, Google and, and Facebook. They have released their own uh, machine learning libraries with also an API like uh, Keras. So the uh, uh, many of these uh, packages which you see here are packages which you're already familiar with. But then you are probably not installed because if, you have, uh, you, if you're using Anaconda, you probably haven't installed scikit-learn and TensorFlow. What happens nowadays is also that many of these uh, uh, so-called integrated development environments like Anaconda, they tend to include TensorFlow and scikit-learn as well. But scikit-learn and TensorFlow are two central machine learning libraries which we are going to use repeatedly. And scikit-learn has a lot of functionality which can also be interfaced with the TensorFlow without any problems. And uh, the, we are going to focus on these libraries, uh, mainly because we won't have the time uh, to actually develop our own programs. But what I would like to give you guys is a kind of uh, uh, the, the mathematical background behind these methods, so that you see what goes on behind the black uh, boxes, inside the black boxes. And if you have time, you can actually program these things yourself. Now, feel free to ask questions if I'm moving ahead a little bit too fast. Uh, I have also recommended textbooks. And by the way, if you are on an IP address of uh, your university, or if you can connect to your university library, most likely the university library has a subscription to Springer, uh, because when the university subscribes to Springer journals, they buy a bundle, uh, they have a bundle agreement where they also get uh, textbooks. So if these textbooks, uh, if you're on a university IP number, you can download them for free, but you will also find them in this uh, uh, textbook link, which I provide on, on the website here. And same with the Aurelien Geron's textbook, is also a pretty good textbook. And that's much more hands-on, and the title is actually Hands-on Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn. If you look into the GitHub addresses of this uh, Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow libraries, you will see that there are something like 2,000 developers for every each one of these libraries. It's a huge community of people which uh, contribute to the development of the libraries. I also have some other general textbooks. There is a textbook which you will also find in this uh, textbook folder by Kevin Murphy, which is uh, the, uh, the, the thick as a brick textbook, uh, which contains essentially all of the mathematics you want to know about different machine learning methods, but it's a little bit more uh, on the mathematical side and it doesn't have any numerical uh, applications, which is a little bit unfortunate because this is an excellent textbook. Okay. Uh, so this was about the uh, where you find the information. The, uh, I should put in the chat the uh, link which I'm going to use when I present uh, uh, the teaching material during the lectures. So I'm going to jump a little bit back and forth between my slides, which you find here. So let me just put that one. So that, that gives you a kind of a quick overview of uh, where I have the slide material. So if you look at this link, which I put in the chat now, you can then uh, quickly dive into the, uh, uh, the different slides. And, and I'm going to use the uh, first day one slides. And I wanted to give you some kind of general 
uh, introduction to machine learning. So machine learning, uh, quantum computing, quantum machine learning, these are really the kind of buzzwords nowadays. And sometimes you have this feeling when I look at uh, many of our own students, both in, in Europe and in the US, and this is probably the same in, in Africa and in Asia, in all continents, it's, you have a feeling that if you can spell machine learning correctly, you even get a proper job. So I've had students who've gotten jobs because they said that they, in the job interview that they were taking a course on machine learning. So there's a lot of uh, uh, buzzwords here, which uh, are, uh, I'm going to skip, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the slides. So the idea is to give you a kind of bird's view over overarching issues on machine learning. And uh, it contains a brief review of programming with Python and, lib and Python libraries, which we will use in these sets of lectures. And uh, nowadays, you guys, uh, due to the course you took the last two weeks, you're pretty uh, familiar with uh, uh, Python. And uh, today we are going to look into a uh, problem from nuclear physics at the end of the lecture today. And uh, this is uh, the fitting of the binding energies. And if you've taken a course in particle and nuclear physics, you probably encountered uh, this beta weissach uh, mass formula. So the physics problem we're going to look at today at the end of these lectures, and you find that in the Jupyter Notebook as well, is the an evergreen in nuclear physics, a classic one, and that's to fit nuclear binding energy based on you reading in the binding energies of uh, all possible nuclei. Okay, so the things which we are going to dive into today is the basic method, which is linear regression, and you may ask, why do we do linear regression? Because that's something which was spelled out by people like Gauss, Laplace, and uh, some of these big, uh, famous mathematicians in the 18th century, 19th century. Uh, but linear regression contains uh, a very uh, many of the basic elements in machine learning, and it links also very well with a statistical data analysis. And as you will see a little bit later today, uh, linear regression it allows us also to obtain analytical expressions for the parameters which we are trying to obtain in order to fit a function. So linear regression, as we are going to look at it now, means that we are going to have a method by which we are going to fit a function, a continuous function. Then we are going to look at the classification problem, which is called logistic regression. And that paves the road for uh, the uh, other methods like neural networks. Uh, we are going to look at decision trees, random forests. There are lots of uh, funny names here like bagging and boosting. So that will be our last day. But then we also need to look at some details on statistical analysis and optimization. So at the heart of every machine learning algorithm, whether this is a neural network or a decision tree, or support vector machines or any kind of machine learning method, there is an optimization problem. Because you're going to have many parameters and at the end you want to optimize a function of many parameters. And the optimization problem is really the working horse of any machine learning algorithm. So these are the kind of topics which I want to cover and we are also going to look at some deep learning methods if we get time like convolutional and recurrent neural networks, and how to also analyze experimental results. So that's more, uh, I want to give you a kind of short overview now. So um, the um, thing is that machine learning, that is the science of giving computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. In a certain sense, this is not fully correct from what you're going to see now. We are going to stay mainly with what's called supervised learning. Uh, neural networks are examples of where the uh, algorithm learns to find the optimal parameters. Uh, if you look at linear regression, this is uh, pretty deterministic. Linear regression deals with you being able to invert a matrix. Alternatively, if you have more advanced forms of linear regression, it's about a convex optimization problem. So when, when it comes to linear regression, you may feel a little bit cheated because you uh, actually end up dealing with linear algebra. 
On the other hand, methods like decision trees, random forests, that's more the algorithm, learning the optimal parameters. And uh, this kind of warning, which is my bias, because there's a lot of hype in the field, is that you should also keep, you should always keep in mind that at the end, uh, there are some humans which have put in some, plugged in some if tests, which have written an algorithm uh, in order to be able to fit data or to classify some specific events. So the, uh, if we now look at the, the field itself, it's an extremely rich field. Uh, there's been a, a huge increase, as you know, in computational capabilities. And that has also been followed by developments of methods and techniques for analyzing and handling large data sets. And that relies heavily on statistics, computer science and mathematics. And the field is actually uh, really developing rapidly. If you look at uh, uh, a field like quantum machine learning, that was basically in existence some few years ago. And now is, there's a lot of activity going on here. And the thing which is also nice with many of these developments is that the, uh, the developments are actually often leading to open source uh, software like uh, Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow and so on with huge communities of people developing the software. So there's a very, very lively community out there. The, um, it's also a multidisciplinary approach. So in some of the methods, you cannot find a rigorous mathematical justification, uh, or some of the methods are very, how to say, low level when it comes to mathematics, like decision trees and random forests. Whereas other ones, like support vector machines, have a very well-established mathematical hierarchy of uh, uh, methods to, to use. So, the um, uh, let me just put on this one here a little bit. Uh, let, and also, let me just fix that one. So, the... Um, if we now move on a little bit, so I want to give you these kind of introductory words first. So this set of lectures, they aim at giving a kind of overview of central aspects of statistical data analysis, as well as some of the central uh, algorithms. And also, I'm going to give you some hands-on uh, exercises, not today, but on from day two and up to day five. Uh, so more specifically, what we will do is to learn a little bit about basic data analysis data optimization and machine learning. Uh, hopefully you be, will be able to extend uh, the knowledge to other systems and cases, uh, have an understanding of central algorithms which are used in data analysis and machine learning. And uh, the methods we will focus on, as I said, are linear logistic regression, decision trees, random forests, and, and up to neural networks and more advanced methods. So the... Uh, the types of machine learning, which we will mainly cover, are methods like, uh, uh, which are normally fall in two categories. These are supervised learning, so we will mainly stay with supervised learning. And supervised learning means that uh, you have had the possibility to label the data. So you have some input variables, and that produces some output, or targets, as we normally call them. And these outputs, the outcome of your experimentation or your theoretical calculation, they are labeled. So you mean, you know that uh, uh, this specific data set corresponds to that specific event. If you're looking at the beta decay, you know then that this event corresponds to one electron beta decay or perhaps a two electron beta decay. Or it could be a classification problem of the type uh, you being able to pay your credit card debt or not being able to pay your credit card date, or whether this could be a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. So that would also be an example of a classification problem. But the data have been labeled, and that's called supervised learning. So you know the answer, and what you want to do now is to find a function, uh, either a continuous function which fits your data, or a discrete function which you can use to classify the data. So this is called supervised learning. Uh, unsupervised learning, which we will probably not have the time to say so much about, is actually a method for finding patterns and relationship in data sets 
without any specific knowledge of the system. And unsupervised learning is the one which is uh, perhaps a little bit more attractive. So if you run experiments in particle physics or nuclear physics, uh, you have uh, terabytes or petabytes of data. And you would like to uh, sort out these petabytes or terabytes of data without having to go manually through them. So that would be an example of where unsupervised learning methods would be very, very interesting to use. And then there's something which is also called reinforcement learning. And uh, we will obviously not have the time to cover all of this. Uh, so you should see this uh, kind of lecture as a kind of entry point to the field. Uh, so some of the common tasks, as we said, are classification. So you can have outputs that are divided into two or more classes. And then the goal is to produce a model that is able to reproduce these uh, classifications which you want to do. This could be images. You want to classify whether it's a cat or a dog or another type of object. Or you want to say that this is the uh, proton which comes out from this uh, type of events or whether it's an electron or it's another type of particle. And these are uh, classification is normally something which falls under supervised learning. Uh, the, uh, I could mention that the uh, Chinese uh, company Alibaba, which is a kind of competitor to Google, they've invested heavily on uh, classification algorithms for recognizing tumors. And the uh, typical pathologist often uses one to two days to go through the scans and look at the different images and say whether, in order to say whether this is a benign tumor or perhaps it's not a benign tumor. And clearly, if the pathologist could use less time on going through all the scans, and you would have a machine learning algorithm which goes through the scans and then points out those cases which may be a little bit more or less clear, then the pathologist could use, spend her or his time on the more difficult cases. So this is a typical example of where you could use machine learning and speed up uh, the medical analysis of uh, an important illness like too, like having cancer. So the, the other thing is regression. So normally when we say regression, we want to find a relationship between an input data set and a reference data set. And the goal then is typically to construct a function that maps input data to continuous output values. And that's a typical example of a, a regression problem. So you want to fit a function. And that's pretty common in physics. You have some uh, data in, some data out, and you would like to find a functional relationship between your inputs and your outputs. And that's where you, in all these cases, you actually have to make a model. And then we also have clustering, uh, which are data which are divided into groups with certain common traits without knowing the different groups beforehand. And this is a kind of form of unsupervised learning. And it's often used in this analysis of huge data sets where you don't have the time to spend uh, ages on uh, running through petabytes of data in order to find some specific events. And this is the typical case where you will use unsupervised learning. So uh, the methods we cover, there are three essential things. Uh, and that's irrespective of whether we deal with them. Uh, oh yeah, it's, uh, we actually going, there's a question in the chat here if it's possible to overfit a model in machine learning. Uh, we're actually going to discuss that uh, next time, in, in day two. We are going to look at uh, something which is called the bias-variance trade-off. And that's a way by which you can see whether you overfit. Because you can tune your model to really go through all the data points. And when you do that, then you can easily lead to overfitting when you apply the model to data sets which have not been included in the training. So this question in the chat is a very important one, guys. So if you look up the chat here, uh, overfitting is one of the central issues. And we are going to see that we're going to split the data in training and test data. Sometimes we also split it into validation sets. That means that we are going to uh, train the model on a limited set of data. So this could be 70, 80% of the data. And then we keep some test data safe in a vault. We don't touch it. And then we apply the model we have trained to that test data. And if we 
uh, train the model to really reproduce every data point in the train set, then we can easily overfit. And this is something we are coming back to. Overfitting or underfitting are central issues in machine learning. So we, this is an important question, actually. And you will see this as a recurring theme in basically all machine learning algorithms. So the um, good questions. The first ingredient is our data set. And that can be subdivided into training and validation and test data. Uh, so normally you just split it into train and test. And uh, scikit-learn, this library, has a function which does that for us. So it shuffles randomly the data sets and then splits it into train set and a test set. Uh, so many of the, uh, in, in this set of lectures, uh, I'm going to, in a way, use some functionality from scikit-learn or read the data which have already been tailored for uh, or prepared for for the machine learning algorithms and some of the difficult parts is actually to read in the data and also to traverse the data because some of the data may actually be faulty because there are humans which have punched in the data sets and you will see that some of the data points have been punched in wrongly so they could have a if there's a classification problem and they classify like in numbers one, two, sometimes you can see a number which shouldn't be there, like minus one, simply because somebody has punched in the data wrongly. So the uh, reading in the data set is a very central aspect of machine learning algorithms and preparing the data sets. Uh, the second item is the model. So we always have to come up with a model. So this could be a function it could be a polynomial, which we want to use to fit uh, some data to some specific de degree. Or it could be a classification model, which we think is relevant for this data set. So the first step, step is your data set. The next is you setting up a model. And this is a difficult part in machine learning, actually. Uh, what kind of model is the best one? Which model does the best, uh, does best in reproducing your data? That's a big, big issue in machine learning. And then finally, the last ingredient is a function, uh, which is normally called the error function or the risk function or the cost function. And that's uh, how you estimate whether this is a good model or not. And a typical function, which many of you probably have met, is the mean squared error. So that's a typical function which is used when you're trying to fit a function you introduce the mean squared error and you use that as a kind of measure to find the optimal parameters of your model. So remember now that if you have a model, this means that you have some parameters. And uh, the, uh, uh, the optimization of that model, so if you look at this uh, cost function here, the, uh, at the heart of every method, there is actually a optimization algorithm. And that leads, since you want to minimize this so-called cost function, so keep this in mind, you have three basic ingredients, your data set, a model which you make up, and then a function to estimate whether this model is a good one or bad one. Now, what you end up with then is an optimization problem. So you want to minimize a, a specific function, and when you minimize, you often do that numerically, except for standard linear regression or ordinary least squares, we have an analytical expression. You can actually invert a matrix, and then you're basically done. So normally you would have to do this numerically, and that leads to the mathematical family of gradient methods, uh, convex optimization problems, and uh, that is actually the working horse of basically all the machine learning algorithms. So if you can make a uh, optimization algorithm which is fast, reliable, and much better than the other ones, you guys are going to get many, many new friends. I, get, I guarantee that. You will become very popular if you can improve uh, just by some few percents existing methods. And uh, if you do neural networks where you can have millions of parameters, clearly you are trying to optimize a multi-dimensional object. And that is 
normally highly non-trivial. So at the heart, and this is something which perhaps disappoints many people when they realize that, that at the heart of basically every machine learning algorithm, there is an optimization problem. So I'm going to skip some of these slides here. And I actually wanted to get into uh, the more hands-on stuff here. So I would suggest that you can read a little bit on these slides here. There's a lot of uh, general wordings. And now I wanted to become a little bit more uh, practical. Uh, there's a lot of discussion of what is a good model and so on. Uh, I will leave this more as a kind of reading background for you guys. And then I'm going to switch uh, to the Jupyter Notebook. So as I mentioned, when you look at the uh, the course material here, you will find uh, standard HTML files or PDF files if you prefer that. But then there's also the Jupyter Notebook. And I'm assuming now that you guys are all wizards when it comes to using Python and Jupyter Notebooks. And that the I can then just jump into the Jupyter Notebook for day one here, if that is okay. And uh, as I said in the beginning, it contains a lot of uh, uh, basic uh, blah blah about the Python installers and so on, which we already mentioned. But then, uh, what I wanted to quickly remind you about is some basic matrix properties. Uh, feel free, anyway, to ask questions in the chat, uh, or if you prefer to unmute yourself, I mean, feel free to do that. The, um, probably this is something which is maybe a little bit boring for you guys, but I just wanted quickly to remind you of it. So there's some basic matrix properties, which you probably are pretty familiar with. But the uh, thing which is important for us is more, uh, how to use NumPy. So let me quickly remind you of that. Uh, last The last weeks you probably have been using NumPy many, many times. And dealing with arrays, because we will need to read in our data set. And that means that we uh, are going to uh, set up at least uh, vectors and matrices or tensors if you go beyond uh, two indices. Oh yeah, no, no, there's a question in the chat here. So everything is available to you guys. So if you go now into uh, uh, the doc folder, uh, you, you can download from that website, you, which we are at now, uh, if you go into this website, let me just restate it here. You can then just download, you click on the Jupyter Notebook. So if you go, oops, sorry, not that one. Do I need to send that to everyone? So if you go to the uh, uh, to this overview page, if you just click on the Jupyter Notebook here, you can download it immediately to your laptop. On the other hand, if you do a Git clone, if you're familiar with Git, as if you have it installed on your uh, laptops or PCs, you can download all the material here. That means that the files which you find, if you go into this doc folder, and you go to the pub folder, so that's where I make the kind of public material, and if you go into day one here, and you click on IPNB, that's the Jupyter Notebook, then you will find the same file which we are looking at now. So that's a day one Jupyter Notebook. And there are also some data files which we are using. So you find all this information here. All the Jupyter Notebook, every source files, every program, everything which is used here is uh, fully available to you. So I hope that uh, answers your question here, Jafar. So you should be able then to install it immediately, download it, and run it on your own machines. So what I did here was simply to bring up some of the things which uh, I, peeped, I actually peeped into what you went through in the last two weeks. So these are things which you most likely have seen. And the uh, what I'm defining here is an array with uh, 10 elements. And the uh, I, I produce a random number which is now given by the normal distribution, as you see here. And I set the size equal to n here. And uh, by the way, guys, I uh, am a strict follower of having all educational material being freely available, always. So, and that's why I provide programs and everything to you guys. I think that is essential for 
progress and for the for the progress of learning. So you should have uh, everything freely available. I'm going to update the material if I spot typos and so on, on a daily basis. Uh, the nice thing with using a software like Git uh, is actually that you can just write in your uh, either via a graphical user interface or in a terminal mode. You just write a Git pull and then you just update your material and have the latest version of it. So if you're not familiar with Git, I'm going to uh, place a video which I made on how to use Git uh, and getting started with it as a version control software. GitHub is just a provider like GitLab or Bitbucket or even Dropbox is a kind of version control uh, system. So what you see here are things like uh, uh, working with arrays, which uh, declaring an array with elements 1, 2, 3, and also acting with NumPy uh, and performing calculations of uh, the elements of an array. And we normally recommend to use NumPy because NumPy is a highly streamlined and vectorized uh, library, uh, which calculates in an efficient way matrix elements, vector elements, uh, with different mathematical functions like the log function, the exponential function. So uh, if you were to calculate uh, these array elements by simply calling xi and uh, setting, calculating the log itself, as we see in this code here, this is something which is less efficient compared to this one. So if you have time and you want to do some timing and you make a huge array with elements, you will see that uh, NumPy gives you a much more efficient way of calculating these types of arrays. So the uh, examples which you find here are probably examples which you've seen before. This is a typical way you would define a matrix. That's also a uh, very efficient uh, way of uh, setting up matrices. But the thing which I wanted to bring up here is actually, uh, I'm going to skip some of the things here. Uh, there is also a reminder on statistic, which I'm not going to uh, go through in these notes uh, or in these lectures, but you can look it up again if you don't remember all the statistical properties we're going to look at. But what I wanted to look at now is a very useful package before we take a small break. And this package is called Pandas. And uh, I don't know if you're fully familiar with it, but it's a very useful package a Python package in dealing with uh, data. So it's actually something which originates from uh, uh, from econometrics and it was seen as an efficient library for data analysis with an emphasis on tabular data. So it has two major classes. One is a data frame uh, with two-dimensional data objects and then you have the one with one-dimensional data object which is called Sirius. There's actually a Python package, which now is called XArray, which allows you to venture beyond two-dimensional ones. So if you have dealing with tensors, that's extremely useful. But Pandas is something which allows us now to uh, display our data and read in the data in a very uh, handy way. Because reading and writing and dealing with the data uh, from that point of view is something which is, when you've done it once, uh, you've done it once and you would like to have an efficient way of displaying your data. There is not much insight in reading and writing data. So if you've done it once, you've done it once. And uh, Pandas allows you to, to code uh, many of these features in a very compact way. So you, can, you would typically import Pandas as PD. Uh, you can now display the data like this and now you can see what kind of movies and books I like to read. Uh, so you can have an index here, first name, last name, place of birth, date of birth. And then you define the data frame and then you can display it. Uh, and then it displays like this. So now in this case, it gives an index, which is just by default, 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, you can change the index. So you see how you can manipulate the data here. So you can change the index by putting a nickname to everyone. So you would have like a Frodo here, Bilbo, Aragon and Sam. So if you've seen the Lord of the, of the Rings series of movies or read the books, uh, this is just tells you what I'm kind of, kind of things I like to see. And you can uh, display the data 
uh, you can easily add new features and then display again as you see here so it's very it's very efficient you can easily set up a matrix like a a uh, 10 by 5 matrix uh, you can then uh, fill in random numbers like this you can calculate the mean value for each column you can calculate the standard deviation for each column you can perform mathematical operations so what you see here is a data set here comes the mean value here comes the standard deviation and then you spit out the matrix squared or the matrix element squared so it's a very compact and easy way of dealing with uh, uh, with data and you can also uh, make plots uh, very useful uh, as well uh, this textbook which i mentioned this uh, python for data analysis uh, contains many more examples so i would like to propose now that we uh, uh, take a small break uh, let's take uh, five uh, five ten minutes and then we begin again uh, just to stretch legs uh, grab something to drink or if you have questions because after the break i just wanted to go through some of the first encounters on uh, data handling and setting up the uh, the uh, the data which we want to analyze which in this case is going to be the uh, the list of a nuclear binding energies so i'm going to take a short break here now and you guys please feel free to ask questions i went a little bit quickly through some of these python issues because i know that you guys have gone through that the last two weeks so the uh, idea now is that you can actually practice and implement many of the things you did last the last two weeks so let's do yeah, some five Martin. minutes and just yeah go yeah. ahead thank you very much Martin. that uh, that's a perfect spot to stop for for a coffee break so should we should we agree to meet again five to ten or ten o'clock what would you suggest Martin? it's almost ten to no, ten we can, uh, yeah, so maybe we, we give people 10 minutes to just uh, recover yeah. after all this, uh, these words of mine, right? Although we meet the, at 10 the, then, right? the distance to the coffee machine, in, this, in my case, because I'm sitting in my lounge, I just need to walk to the kitchen, it's not too far, but uh, 10 yeah. minutes is a nice, is a nice break. Thank yeah. you very much. And don't go away. Okay. Maybe just put your, your, your Zoom settings on, on, on mute. And, uh, and we meet again in, in, in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. If you want to unmute yourself and your things you're wondering about or uh, something unclear, and, or, or put the questions in the chat here. That's also perfect. This is fantastic to see all these places. I wish really we could have met in person. So you can uh, you can download. Um, uh, so one of the things you can do, I'm, I'm actually going to put this uh, as a question here in the chat. Do I have to download GitHub for me to access those files? No, you, you don't need to do that. You can actually download file by file if you want to. So if you let me just share the screen with you here. So again, uh, so one thing you can do. Uh, so let me just put that. So one of the things which you could do is now if you go into the uh, the basic link where you find all the material, and you could now go into. Uh, so if we if we if we go into the basic one, I know it was my wireless was a little bit slow now. So if you, why is it so slow? So today I had some problems with a slow internet connection here. Here we are. So if you go into this doc folder, uh, then you can always uh, uh, go to uh, uh, any of these files like pub here. And if you just want the Jupyter notebooks, you can then go into one of the days. Today is day one. And uh, if you can uh, go in there, you can just go into the Jupyter notebook folder or the PDF folder, and there you see the Jupyter Notebook. So you can just download that one to your machine if you want to. Alternatively, 
uh, if you want to install uh, GitHub and Git, then you can uh, always do that. So the uh, uh, I'm going to put uh, in the main in the main folder here. Yes, so it depends a little bit. So you're asking about the randomizing uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the design matrix. So no, often people do that uh, because you want to reshuffle your data. This come is something we will discuss a little bit uh, the next time uh, with the connection resampling techniques. So you randomize your data. So and then you can think of every time you do a data analysis or you fit a model, you have randomized the data so that the data comes in a slightly different order. And you normally split the data between test and training data. And there are things like resampling techniques, which are meant to give a, uh, a little bit better, uh, how to say, estimate of the standard errors in the, in the, uh, in the models which you make the fit up. Okay, so there's a question about uh, renewable energy. Uh, so the, um, uh, the thing with machine learning is that uh, machine learning is being used everywhere. Uh, thinking of renewable energy, uh, I can just give you an example. I had a, a student of mine who, uh, what, uh, what she did was to take data from uh, uh, the, uh, the water system in, in the city of Oslo, Norway. So you have uh, points where you measure the uh, water pressure. And uh, what they were looking at was the uh, transport of heat, because we have uh, uh, warm water which is being recycled by different uh, waste burners. And that's fed into many different condominiums. And then they wanted to figure out uh, how to make this uh, distribution of uh, warm water based on recycling waste uh, in in the most efficient way. So what they had was measurements from different uh, uh, gauges which measure the pressure. And they could see typically when people wake up in the morning, they take a shower. When they come back from work, they may be using more hot water. And then based on the, uh, the pressure measurements in these different gauges uh, spread out all over the city, they could make a model based on where they saw the peaks in uh, the consumption of, of uh, hot water, how they could, uh, in the most efficient way, uh, use, the, uh, use the waste uh, recycling uh, burning or the burning of waste in order to produce uh, hot water. So that was an example of using, uh, in connection with renewable energy, and, and using that waste which you were burning to produce heat in the most efficient way. So you may not realize that, but machine learning is actually being used everywhere. That's just one example of how to uh, do renewable energy with machine learning methods. Because in many cases, you don't have a proper model, and then you're using the data, uh, or you don't, have a, the, uh, you don't know exactly what's the, uh, the f way to model that specific system, and then you often use data to cook up a specific model. So coming back to Git and GitHub, uh, I'm going to place a, uh, a video which I made some time ago on how to install Git and GitHub. Uh, or if you want to use GitLab, which is just another provider which many people use. Uh, so GitHub is, uh, was one of the first ones, and you would find many of these big uh, libraries like TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn. They've been placed on GitHub, but many people also use GitLab or Bitbucket and so on. And uh, they are equally fine, all of them. And some are more popular simply because many people started to use, these were the first ones which came on the market. But Git is just one of uh, several version control softwares. And it's become popular because it's very efficient and it works best on text files. So what it does is it just keeps the changes you made in text files. And then when you go back to a version which you had, let's say two days ago, it simply reconstructs uh, that text file as it was two or three days ago. If you have images and so on, 
then you need uh, to actually save a new image every time. So it's not so efficient on uh, files beyond plain text files. And that's often what you end up doing when you are developing code or you're writing on some documents. It's fantastic to see where you all you guys are from. I wish I could have been here. I wish we could have been together, all of us. That would be pretty cool. And next time we will all be in the same location. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I've only been to South Africa once. We were teaching at the, this Chris Engelbrecht the summer school in 2009, and it was a fantastic experience. Okay, okay. It's really Fantastic. one of the countries they want to visit again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. As, as soon as the <laughs> flights reopen, we will make a plan. Mm. Yeah. What do you say, guys? Should we start again? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I, I fear you don't have much of a break. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if you're ready, yeah. 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 Okay. So let's uh, let's get started again here, and. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook and we are now going to look at the uh, data fitting problem and I wanted to show you some of the features which we have uh, in scikit-learn. So many of the basic algorithms like linear regression, uh, some of the uh, decision trees, random forest methods, uh, logistic regressions, they've actually been encoded into this library, Scikit-Learn. Now, Scikit-Learn, however, uh, is much weaker on uh, deep learning. So that means uh, neural networks, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, autoencoders, and many of these more advanced methods. But it provides many of the basic, uh, uh, how to say, algorithms for dealing with data, it provides the basic uh, interface to making predictions, to fit the data, and so on. So we are going to meet below here uh, the, uh, the uh, data sets, which we uh, wanted to discuss, these nuclear uh, binding energies. But we are going first to look at a simple example. So uh, the example we are going to look at now is this uh, fitting this uh, pretty <laughs> boring function. So just a, a, f a first order polynomial. So I'm going to do 100 data points. And then we are going to have some random noise. So when I write this n here, it means that uh, it's a random distributed noise uh, with a zero mean value and with a variance which is equal to 1. So we are coming back to some of these things later. And what we are going to make now is a simple linear regression fit where we now make a model. So in my slides, you will now see y here is the output. So this is your data. And x is the input. Now y tilde is my model. And what I'm going to do now is just to fit the first order polynomial. This is not very exciting. And uh, I'm going to have the intercept alpha. And then I have the parameter beta in front of the, uh, uh, the, the first order polynomial. Uh, power the, the, the x to the first or, or to the first and there's a function in scikit-learn which is called fit so you feed in x and you feed in y and then it gives you a fit so the way you would do that now is in the following way so this is a pretty simple function so i have my x which are just given by random numbers and i rewrite this as a matrix now you see it's a hundred times one because scikit-learn uh, takes actually the data set in as matrices. And then y is now my simply my fit of this one. I just transform it into a matrix with a one column. So it's, it has a feature now which is just given by uh, just one column here. And then I do my linear regression. So this is now a package which I import. So scikit-learn, I import the linear model. And that means I need to import this linear regression. Uh, I import that one, I define a, an object, which is called linreg. I then perform a fit on all the data, and then I just define a new array and then uh, of data between 0 and 1. And then I make a prediction here. And you see now that uh, when my noise is pretty large, 
to make a linear fit so the 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 dots here they are just the uh, data points whereas the straight line here is now my fit and that's not very impressive and clearly as you would expect if i now reduce the noise here so if i make this much smaller so i just have a factor of zero one here and i rerun then you will see that now everything is much nicer so this kind of uh, watching by the eye the data sets is something which uh, is not how to say the way you would do it we actually need to find measures on, on how we actually gauge whether this uh, fit is a good one or a bad one so looking at it by the eye uh, it seems like we are doing a decent job but we need to have some more precise ways of estimating whether the model we cooked up so this is our data which we have here and here and we simply fit a linear model here so by using this linear regression fit so that's as i said is not the best way of doing it uh, to gauge whether the model is a good one or not so it means that typically what we would do now is to uh, introduce some kind of measures and that defines our cost function. So some function which you may have met is something which is called the chi-square per datum. So this is related to the mean squared error, which is a standard function in basically all the machine learning methods when we're making a fit. So we take y, the data points, minus the values for the model. Normally, we, uh, if we don't have the variance, uh, we don't scale it with that one. So we would simply have... Uh, put the variance to one and then we have the mean the standard mean squared error so this is just a variant of what's normally called the mean squared error now one of the reasons as you will see now when we come to day two uh, is that uh, the mean squared error one of the reasons we use that one instead of the relative error is that the derivatives uh, the derivative of the mean squared error is a continuous function and that is going to give us an algorithm which allows us to find an analytical function for these parameters which we have up here, these parameters alpha and beta, which you see here. And uh, if we had a relative error, we would not have an analytical function for the derivatives. Or rather, we would have an analytical function, but we would actually have to deal with the absolute values. And that would complicate the setup of the optimization algorithm. So the uh, typical, so you could have used the relative error, which is now simply the absolute value of uh, your data points minus the model. Uh, but the problem with that one is that it gives us a derivative, which now depends on actually the absolute value here. And that makes it less handy. So uh, one of the things you can do now, if you look at uh, this uh, simple Python function here, I perform the fit. And then what I do now afterwards is actually to plot uh, the absolute or the relative error. So I make my prediction and I take, uh, subtract the uh, data points and then I divide by the absolute value here. Uh, this case as well is not, when you look at it, when you just look at the graph here, uh, you see that there are points uh, which still give a large relative error. And uh, it doesn't give you a kind of, uh, just watching at the graph here, is something which uh, is not that useful if you want to assess whether this is a good model or not. So one of the things you will encounter now in scikit-learn, for instance, but it's also easy to make these functions yourself, is a uh, set of functionalities which uh, go under the package metrics. So one thing it can compute is the mean squared error. So you can compute many types of errors. You can compute something which is called the R2 score. Uh, so the mean squared error, if that is zero, it means that we would have a perfect fit. So we would like the mean squared error to be as small as possible. The R2 score, as you will see from the equations below, uh, is equal to one if you have a perfect fit, and then it's different from one if you don't have. You can calculate the mean absolute error like you see here, and many other quantities. So scikit-learn has, has lots of functionality here. So again, you see the function we are fitting. It's just a random x values between 0 and 1. We uh, 
have a function now which goes like an intercept with 2 plus 5 times this x, and then I have a random noise here, which is normally distributed. I do a linear regression, I make a fit, and, and then I make a prediction. So this is the predict function in scikit-learn. And on day two, which means Wednesday, we are going to derive and write our own code for doing all these statements here. But scikit-learn now is handy. It gives us this functionality and it allows us to set up these quantities easily. So the, uh, uh, you can now calculate the intercepts. You can find the coefficients in the fit, which are the parameters in your polynomial expansion. You can then calculate the mean squared error. You can calculate the R2 score, mean squared error, and so on. So you can now see, uh, in this case, we had noisy data. So it doesn't give you an intercept, which is 2. So if I now rerun this, so let me just uh, decrease it a little bit. So let me just... So what we're going to do now is to reduce the noise. So let's take a small noise here and rerun uh, this code. And what you will see then, so we had an, an intercept now with the noise plays a much smaller role. Uh, we have an intercept which is 2.0 and you see that that's uh, close to 2. We have the uh, uh, the uh, parameter, the constant in front of x, which is 5, and now you see that's close to 5. So with the two leading numbers after the decimal point, two leading digits after the decimal point, we get a mean squared error, which is 0. It's actually not exactly equal to 0, but I just printed it out with two leading decimals. And then it has a, a variance score, or an R2 score, which is close to 0. And you see now that the fit looks much nicer. So a uh, straight line is now a good model for reproducing this data. So we have a mean squared error, which is basically basically 0 here. If I... Yeah, now, this is uh, what I'm doing here. So there's a good question in the chat. How does one know how much noise to introduce in the calculation? Here, I'm doing it myself, right? But normally, you don't know the noise. And this is actually one of the difficulties in, in the data set which you have. When you run an experiment, so if you're running an experiment in, let's say, particle physics or nuclear physics, there's a lot of background noise. And uh, one of the big issues is how do we model the background noise? How do we handle it? So here, I can just play around with it, right? And you clearly see that if you want to fit a linear model to what we have, uh, and you have more noise, then this is not the the best fit you can make, right? So the uh, uh, if you increase that one, you would actually get a... Uh, so I just need to reload my... Uh, let me just reload my Jupyter Notebook here. Just a small thing here. Because I clicked away... I don't know why, but my... My wireless has been a little bit slow today. Let me try to let me just try to redo this one. So the question of noise is is actually something which uh, uh, is a big issue when you deal with your data sets. Okay, it seems my uh, Jupyter Notebook is a little bit slow. Uh, okay, here it comes up again. So I, I have some... It my, it's actually my internet provider here, which is not doing the job properly this, this day. So let's go down again and go back to that example which we had. So the, um, this was the example we were looking at. And we have an, uh, an intercept now, which is uh, uh, pretty, uh, it's, it's close to what we had, but then we change the results. So if we run it again, you will now see that the intercept deviates from 2.0. And when you look at the data, you also see now that the mean squared error has increased to 0.23. And then the variance score is 0 .20, 0 0.91. So the, uh, that function which you have, coef, 
gives us a parameter beta, while the intercept yields this parameter alpha. And that function which we looked at, mean squared error, is a function now which is defined as the expected value, the expectation value of your sample. So it takes the data points which you have, minus the model, and then squares. So this function here is a function which we're going to see again and again. And we're actually going to use that one and minimize that one with respect to the parameters. And we're going to do that on, uh, on day two. And then you're going to see that uh, when you optimize this function by taking the derivatives of the parameters and setting it to zero, the derivatives, then you're going to get a, a, prob a mathematical problem which simply deals with the inversion of the matrix to find the optimal parameters. We also have this R2 score, which is one, if you have an ideal fit. Uh, we have other quantities like the uh, uh, mean squared logarithmic error, like this one. You have the mean absolute error, which is given by this quantity. And there are many, many other types of uh, so-called cost functions, which you can use to optimize the parameters. And some of these are well adapted to a specific problem. So the kind of problems we're going to look at now are problems where the mean squared error is an optimal function to minimize. So what I wanted to, to, to uh, we're going to skip some of these. Now I wanted to come to the first physics examples and we're going to use the last 15-20 uh, minutes to discuss that one. So this is a case from nuclear physics and uh, it contains uh, all experimental uh, binding energies of nuclei. So this is something like 3000 plus nuclei. And uh, uh, you know that atomic masses are typically tabulated in terms of the mass excess. So what you is this atomic mass units. And the data which you have are really data, uh, very precise data on measurements of masses of atomic nuclei. So you would typically strip an atomic nucleus for all the electrons and you would use devices like penning traps or pole traps to actually measure the, the masses of atomic nuclei to very high precision. And the quantities which you normally tabulate, so there's a mass evaluation where these authors, uh, there's a, this is something which happens every five years, there is a new mass evaluation, five, four or five years, and they take all the known nuclei and they also make extrapolations based on known masses to uh, nuclei which haven't been measured. And the quantity which you typically end up with is a quantity called the binding energy, which is now the, uh, the uh, energy of, uh, of all the protons plus the, that of the neutron minus this mass excess. This is a typical quantity which you will find tabulated in, in the literature. And the file uh, which we have is if you now go back to the uh, to the doc folder and we take a look into the file uh, this is an output from a, uh, a program so and if we now go into the pop folder for day one you will find the data files so let's take a look at that so we take the Jupyter notebook and then there's a set of data files and uh, what I did now was actually to take this mass evaluation from 2016 and then if we take a look at this file here uh, what you will see so it's a little bit slow my connection today yeah I don't know why it doesn't display so I have some connectivity problem today actually I'm sorry for that so it's uh, it's more the link to a uh, my connection to GitHub, which is the uh, is a little bit slow. It connects some websites pretty well, but the other ones are a little bit slower here. But anyway, this file here contains uh, uh, lots of outputs. It's something like 39 columns in the output. And uh, there are only some specific columns which we want to read in. So let's, uh, in the meantime, while this file is loading, let's go back to the Jupyter Notebook. So, what we are going to do now is a, make a model and the model for the uh, masses is something which is based on the liquid drop model and uh, if you've taken a course in particle and nuclear physics you probably encountered this model so we have a term here which depends on the 
on the volume term. So we're assuming that an atomic nucleus depends on the volume and where the radius now is actually one third of the number of uh, nucleons, protons and neutrons. There is a surface term because it's a finite surface. There is a uh, so-called Coulomb term which is assumed to be inversely proportional with the number of protons and neutrons to the power of one third. There is an as asymmetry term and then there are more complicated terms which you can add. But you see now that we, we are going to make a fit now in terms of uh, the number of neutrons and protons. And the kind of fit we are going to make is going to be a little bit simpler than uh, the more refined ones because we are not going to bring in the number of neutrons and protons in this term here. But we are simply going to have a fit in terms of A. So let me just see if this data file has loaded properly. Here is the data file. So it took some time before it loaded. So it contains some uh, initial statements. And now you will see the data sets which come like this. So this is a typical example. And when I showed this uh, manipulation of uh, the data file using pandas, uh, the, the first time when I did it, there was a student in the audience who told me that he had spent two months in setting up a program to read in uh, the data set and find the binding energy, which would be this specific column which you see here. And then you see that you have the number of neutrons, the number of protons, the total number, there's a name of the element, uh, you have the mass excesses, and then you have the binding energies. And these are the quantity which we want to fit. So he spent something like two months to figure out how to read in the data properly. And you can do this with pandas, you can do this with just some few lines. So let's see how we can do that. So we need to organize the data. That's the first thing. So I like to make some uh, uh, files in the beginning here where I simply now set up directories where I spit out the results, I have my data files and so on. So these are just some basic Python uh, beginning steps. And then I have my data path where I now have the mass yeah. evaluation of from 2016. So I'm just setting up the file I want to read. And then I'm going to use pandas to manipulate the data. So uh, the data now, as I said, and when you looked into this data file, has actually uh, something like 3,436 lines and 124 characters per line. So it's actually an old Fortran file which spits out this data. And this is the Fortran format. So it's, uh, this means it's a character with one uh, space, uh, an integer with three spaces, an int so i is an integer, and then there are characters, f is a float, and so on. So you have to look into this one in order to find out uh, what are the widths of the parameters which I've written out. And then you can use pandas. So pandas has an option which says that formatted write file, fwf. So I take read. If you have a CSV file, a comma separated values, then you would just write CSV instead of FWF. And I want to use the columns 2, 3, 4, 6, and 11. So what I've done now is to go into this data, this ugly data file, and I'm counting the columns. So I want to use these specific columns like column 2 and 3, and I want to use column 4, and I also want to have the name of the elements, and so on. So I want the columns 2, 3, 4, 6, and 11. So you see column 2 is the number of neutrons, 3 the number of protons, A is the number of uh, nucleons, of so neutrons plus protons, 6 is the element name, and 11 is the binding energy. That's the quantity I want to look at. And I have to specify these things here, unfortunately. So this is an old formatted file written in Fortran. But Pandas has this flexibility, which makes life much, much easier. Then what I'm doing now is to define an array uh, in terms of the binding energies. So now it picks and it transfers to numeric, the binding energies. Uh, I want to drop cases where I don't have a number because that happens. And then I just convert everything into uh, mega electron volts instead of electron volts. And so these three lines, that's so easy. Then I can regroup my data because now I want to make a fit of the data in terms of the nuclear number, the total number of protons and neutrons. So I want to make a fit now where I'm 
actually going to uh, make the fit. So I'm going not to have Z and N minus Z, so it's not going to be the best models. So, yeah, so the columns are counted from 1. Yeah, right. But you remember that in Python you start everything with 0 as the first element. But the, the way when you so the columns in the are you thinking of the columns in the data file or the columns in the in the Python array? Because Python array starts with zero. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, uh, the uh, uh, fit which I'm going to make is going to be a fit without set and n and z. So I'm just going to have a here. So it means that I'm not going to get uh, a kind of uh, fully uh, physical fit but the thing here now is that so I group everything by A and uh, so remember now again that Python has all arrays starting with zero and then I uh, take now only the largest uh, binding energies for a given element so this is something which as I want only want to fit a limited set and this now gives me when I write A is a number of uh, so I just take that from pandas when I read in here, so I have now a label, A for the number of uh, 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 nucleons, Z for the number of protons, N for the number of neutrons, and then I just print out just to see that I'm getting data which looks reasonable. So my data set now is going to be 267 rows times 5 columns. And now I'm setting up my model. So my model now has 5 features. Because I'm making a polynomial fit, so the first column is the intercept. And on day two, we are going to look at the mathematics of this. So right now, I'm throwing this object to you, which is the design matrix. So that contains my data. So it has the features of my model. Intercept, power 1, a to the power of 1, polynomial a to the power 1, polynomial of a to the power of 2 thirds, which is the surface term a to the power of minus one third, which is a Coulomb term, and then a to the power of minus one, which is a volume term. So if I, uh, then I run this one, and then I'm now going to use uh, my scikit-learn, uh, my, my scikit-learn uh, implementation here. So I have a linear regression. I do a fit. So X is my design matrix. And the energies are my outputs, which I want to fit. And here's my prediction. So this is pretty simple. On day two, we are going to write our own program for this. But now, the thing I want you to uh, uh, note is that we need something which is called a design matrix. And that contains the features of the model. So every column in this matrix corresponds to the data sets to a given power in the polynomial fit which we make. So we have five terms we now want to fit, the intercept, and then the terms which are related to the different powers in A. This is our model. Keep that in mind. You can refine this and make it more complicated if you want to. Then, uh, what we do next is that I print the mean squared error. So I, know I made a fit. So I take my energies, I have my fitted uh, y, and I transfer that to the mean squared error. I want to calculate the R2 score. I can calculate the mean absolute error if I want to. And then I'm making a plot. And so you can see now that the mean squared error is not that bad. I'm fitting on all these data sets. I have a variance score, which is close to 1. It's not so bad. Now, these parameters are a little bit different from those which you will find in the literature, and that's simply because we also included a fit with the intercept here, which we normally would not do. So I have an intercept here. And we are coming back to that on day two. Because scikit-learn normally takes away the intercept. It scales the data. And in the model itself, I shouldn't have used an intercept. But So we are coming back to that. It means that if you look at these parameters and you want to f compare them with uh, what you've seen in the literature, they will be slightly different. But my fit is not that bad. You can then uh, use other methods which we are coming back to, like uh, decision trees. Uh, you can make a decision tree deeper and deeper. We are coming back to that on the last day. So we are going back to this fit with decision trees. 
and you can actually make a fit which actually traverses almost all the data. Uh, the, we are coming back to these quantities. You can use neural networks, which we will also come back to. But what I wanted you to, uh, to see now is an essential ingredient, which uh, is an ingredient we are going to start with on day two. And that's the setup of this feature matrix. The, um, uh, I also want to give you a little bit of the motivation with uh, uh, linear regression and why we are doing linear regressions. So what we are having now is a set of parameters, beta. Uh, it's actually the method of choice often if we want to fit a continuous function. It uh, gives analytical expression for these parameters, beta. Uh, I'm just, I just, I'm just going to come back to the questions here. So if I now uh, look at the linear regression, which we're going to derive in more detail on day two, uh, it contains uh, the possibility to have an analytical relation with probabilistic interpretation. It gives us analytical expression for the fitting parameters. It also allows us for an easy hands-on understanding of these gradient methods. So the, there's a lot of interesting stuff which we can gain from uh, linear regression. Uh, I would recommend uh, the following things uh, before we meet again. There is a fantastic article by Meta Dal. Pankai Meta is a particle physicist who has also been dealing with many, many other applications of uh, uh, machine learning algorithms to life science problems. This article here is a physics report and it contains uh, Jupyter notebooks for every data set they have analyzed. So this, this means that you can actually take this article and reproduce everything they have in it. And it gives a very good overview of machine learning methods applied to physics. It's highly recommended. If you want more the mathematics of linear regression, this article by Van Veringen is excellent. So my kind of homework for you guys, uh, till we meet again, uh, take a look at the slides on, uh, on linear regression, which we have here from this step. Uh, if you have time, look into Meta's article, which is really excellent. So what I can conclude from the recent graph, there's a question in the chat here. So what should we conclude? Uh, what we could conclude is that we get a decent overall fit. But clearly, you see now that the cases like these ones do not give a very good fit. But the overall fit to the binding edges, in particular when we now uh, pass the brink here, uh, with the, uh, uh, where we have iron, and we go into the region more where fission is the relevant physical process, uh, we get a pretty decent fit to the, uh, to the nuclei. But whereas nuclei around here, and especially light nuclei, where we uh, have, uh, uh, how to say, uh, we have uh, important shell effects, uh, the, uh, the kind of liquid drop model is an oversimplification. And you see very clearly here that for some of the light ones, we do a pretty bad job in reproducing the data. So that's one of the things. So you could think, you can conclude that uh, this kind of liquid drop model, which we used here, this model here, which you will see in every uh, nuclear physics textbook, does a prison, pretty decent job in the overall fit, but it misses many of the uh, nuclei where you have closed shell systems, uh, especially on the life or the light nuclei, where actually correlations play a much more important role when you go to heavier nuclei, where often a mean field description is a better is a, is a pretty good uh, description of uh, nuclei. So that's one of the things you could, could conclude. It gives an overall decent fit of the data. And many of these parameters are what you might call physically motivated. So you think there's a volume term which is proportional with the number of nucleons, and we know that the energy is an extensive quantity. Then there's a surface term. That assumption here is that the nucleon at the surface of the nucleus interacts with a fewer other nucleons than in the interior. So these parameters are very much physically motivated and it's called the liquid drop model. So that's what I would conclude from that specific graph actually. So this ends today's lecture and then on uh, the next day we are going to dig a little bit deeper into uh, 
linear regression and try to understand what is actually happening, what are the mathematical expressions which you're interested in. So this was more to get us started and see how we can use libraries like scikit-learn. Feel free to download this material, use it as you want, uh, use the, uh, uh, the Jupyter notebooks, play around with them, uh, try to link them with what you've seen before. So that's the kind of homework I'm going to give you guys. Uh, and then uh, I highly recommend to take a look at Meta's article here, the one which we have listed down here this one and you can see if you now get it up here uh, if you now download it uh, you will see that there is a link to uh, Jupyter Notebooks and you can actually run all these Jupyter Notebooks so this was published in Physics Reports in 2019 okay I'm going to stop here now Yeah, thank you very much, Morten, for an excellent introduction to, to machine learning. And um, I'm sure uh, we will have uh, plenty more, <laughs> more questions. I don't know if now or in the, uh, in the coming uh, days. Um, I see the, 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 the chat was quite active and you <laughs> addressed, I think, all the questions and, and, and comments that, uh, that were raised. Uh, but maybe <clears throat> if we want to uh, invest another five minutes so because we went already a little bit uh, over time uh, if there are some urgent questions please uh, just uh, just pose them either using the chat or, or just by unmuting yourself um, let's let's uh, let's uh, steal another five minutes of Morton's time and uh, and then we can readjourn and get ready for this afternoon session so there's a very good question in the chat here uh, yes. So if we do not have a model, how should we deal with a bunch of data? Now, the, um, one of the ways you do that, so this enters uh, the realm of, uh, of uh, unsupervised methods. And what you would typically do then, you have something like clustering algorithms, where you try to f let the algorithm find features which are common to a set of the data. But in general, when you don't have a model for the data, uh, then uh, you uh, actually into the, the domain of unsupervised learning. So one method is to find data which are close to each other. You use something like a k-mean method or clustering methods. Uh, you can also use something which is a principal component analysis. So you can look, uh, you can actually look into your data because your data uh, normally you have some features which you're looking after and uh, uh, if you don't have a model you could still have data which have been labeled so you could still do supervised learning and one of the things you could do then if you have labeled data is to construct uh, something which is called a correlation matrix and then you could see and we are actually going to look at an example uh, on uh, day two, that means Wednesday for, for this data, uh, where we first calculate the correlation matrix and then we find that some of the, the features are strongly correlated. And then you could make a model based on those features which have strong correlations. So if you look at this uh, tumor data, uh, you will find that there are some specific, so this tumor data is, is called the Wisconsin uh, breast cancer data they have something like 30 features so the pathologists they would have things like the perimeter of the tumor the thickness of the tumor the color of the tumor uh, the radius of the tumor and so on and this data set have 30 such features and then you will see that some of these are more correlated than other ones and then you could think of making a model where you only take these most important features. So the, uh, the, uh, the uh, data, so if you don't have a model, that's one thing you could do. Uh, but if you, are, if you have unlabeled data, which means that you're doing unsupervised learning, then you have the whole field of clustering algorithms which are being used to do that. So that means that you could then uh, make a screening of your data and find some specific clusters. 
So we've, we've been applying that to analysis of experiments from uh, time chambers, where you often uh, send in uh, nuclei into a gas, and uh, you can produce tons of events, and there's a lot of noise. So by clustering algorithms, you can cluster out what looks like a proton event, or like a carbon coming out, or whatever things you're looking after, and then you would have to go in by hand and look at those data which uh, uh, belong to a specific category. So this is clustering algorithms. So normally with label data, you would actually use a lot of your physics insights. So I hope that uh, uh, so clustering algorithms, correlation matrices, principal component analysis are methods which are often used in these cases. So uh, there's another question in the chat here. Is that right that supervised learning is just the same as doing a fit to your data? Uh, that is correct. So if you, if you have a, a data set where you want to, uh, uh, to fit a continuous function, then you can use uh, neural networks, which allow you to fit complex functions. You can use uh, linear regression. You can use support vector machines. So supervised learning uh, normally deals with two cases. Regression, which is basically fitting a function to your data, uh, but where the function is meant to be a continuous function. Or, if you have a, a classification problem, you would have discrete outcomes, like a benign tumor or malignant tumor, or yes and no, minus one, plus one. So then you would use what's normally called a logistic regression, or a standard classification algorithm. So in essence, it's actually you finding a model and fitting that to your data. So uh, many people get a little bit disappointed when they see that because you, to the uh, uh, algorithm, you would add lots of parameters which you tune to get the best possible fit. So that's why I say when you're doing machine learning, there's a lot of uh, things which doesn't sound like an automatic uh, machine learning algorithm, but it's more like a, an optimization problem. But then when you go to unsupervised learning, that's uh, where really you have the strength of machine learning algorithms in the sense that you, uh, uh, in the sense that you have a, uh, the possibility to find the data with similar features. Uh, hey, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I say question. thank you very much, Morten. Maybe, yeah. Ah, okay. Maybe let's consider the, this is the last question. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm sure but, that one is, uh, we will never end this morning. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, there's a question here. Don't we have to perform a basic EDA on the data set to explore the, its viability before attempting any fit? That's correct. I mean, the, the difficult part and which we are going to hide in these lectures because we're going to focus on the algorithms is actually uh, you going through the data set. They, they are <laughs> not analyzing, not looking at your data set is a big sin. So you have, to, you have to prepare your data set for these specific machine learning algorithms. And that can often be the most painful exercise. And I will save you for that, guys, because we are going to more look at the algorithmic part. So we won't cover that uh, part in detail. So like I, I told you, the student uh, which I met who had been reading this nuclear data uh, actually spent almost two months in figuring out how to read the data and set up the data for making a, uh, uh, a fit to the data sets. So that's, the, uh, that's actually one of the big, big topics. I mean, you understanding your data. And that's where we come in as physicists. Yeah, Morten, thank you very much. I think this is the, the, the perfect comment to finish your, 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 first, um, your first lecture this, this morning. So I, I would like to, uh, to thank you very, very much for an excellent start of your, of your lecture series. Uh, I'm sure that all the participants uh, will enjoy uh, browsing your GitHub repository and um, and reading the the, the, the various uh, books and articles that that you recommended, and maybe starting practicing a little bit. 
uh, between now and two o'clock, because at two o'clock <laughs> they need to be all back in Zoom for the first lecture in the computational fluid dynamics uh, mini course, let's call it like that, uh, that, that, that starts this afternoon. So, uh, Morten, thank you very much again. Uh, thank you very much to all the, the participants. Uh, I think we will see you again, Morten, on, on, on Wednesday, because tomorrow uh, we have uh, the first two lectures of the other two, two courses. Yeah? So thank you very much uh, for, for your time and for the, all the effort that you put in preparing your, your GitHub repository. And um, yeah, and I wish you a, a good rest of the day and um, uh, all the best also to the, to the participants who will probably play around in, with Jupyter Notebooks uh, just now. And, and I will see them again at, at two o'clock. So Morten, thank you very much again. And uh, we will see you in a couple of days. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. Great pleasure Bye. to meet you all. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye.